We're going to be in the book of Judges. The book of Judges. And we're going to be in the 13th chapter of the book of Judges. And we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. So if you have any other translation, that's okay because the word of God is still the same. Um, But we'll have it in the New Living Translations. Again, that's Judges chapter 13, and we're going to start at verses 1 and read through verses 8. Amen, amen. Thank God for, again, all of those that have helped out with the service this morning. God has been faithful, and I pray God blesses you for all that you've done. If you're able to, we're going to ask if you could stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Judges chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And this is how it reads. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Philistines who oppressed them for 40 years. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, even though you have been unable to have children. You will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. And verse 6 says, The woman ran and told her husband, A man of God appeared to me. He looked like one of the God's angels, terrifying to see. I didn't ask where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he told me, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. For your son will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the moment of his birth until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, saying, Lord, Please let the man of God come back to us again and give us more instruction about this son who is to be born. This morning, I want to talk to you from this thought. It's worth the work. It's worth the work. Let's pray over God's word. Lord God, we pray today that you will show us that following your instructions and doing what you've called us to do is worth the work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have your seats in the presence of God this morning. Amen. Amen. It's worth the work. I believe I can speak for for, for most mothers and, and parents in general that raising kids can be difficult. It is a beautiful thing to bring kids into the world. I've experienced this for the last four years of my life. In four years, I've had three kids, so obviously... <laughs> I believe that having kids is a beautiful thing, but I'm not naive to the fact that even though there are times when kids are sweet and they're innocent and they're loving and they're just beautiful to look at, there are times when they are terrors. <laughs> or maybe I'm just speaking about my kids. Maybe y'all got the perfect behaving, well-mannered, beautiful kids, but sometimes kids can be difficult to deal with. And when they're difficult to deal with at times, you have to discipline them properly because you don't want them to go out into the world and act the complete fool when you're not around. You want to raise them up and and help them to uh, assimilate into society and be well-mannered and well-behaved. And that requires discipline. And I've learned even over these four years that it requires some effort and it requires some work. And at times even brings about some stress to raise children and and to discipline them and to make them become and help them become the the people that they should be as they are adults. And I just am so grateful for the fact of all the mothers that dedicated their time, that dedicated their hard work, that gave everything they had, even at the expense of their own health, at the expense of their own time, at the expense of their own comfort, to raise children to be model citizens in this world. Kids don't stay kids forever. They eventually grow older and become a part of society independent from you as a parent. And eventually as that child grows up, you pray and hope that the training that you gave them, the the, the knowledge that you instilled in them shows up and they become a successful part of society. 
And in the end, you'll realize that through all the ups and downs, through all the time you spent, through all the hard work that you did, that as you see them, as they flourish as an adult, that the work you did was worth it. The work that you put in, the time that you put in, the, the, the way that you carried yourself and how you sacrificed for them, that it was worth it in the end. It was worth the work that you did. It was all worth it. It can be challenging for us to stay vigilant when we do have a calling on our life and we are called to do things for the kingdom of God. It can be challenging to, to stay on the grind and doing what God has called us to do. Because we know that good times and bad times fluctuate in our lives. There are different seasons and, and different times of our lives where, where things are going exactly the way we want them to and in other seasons where everything seems to be crumbling around us. But I want to encourage somebody today and let you know that it is worth the work of staying committed to doing God's word, will in your life. That it is worth the work. I know sometimes the, that as Christians, we have to do things that are countercultural and we have to love those that are unlovable and we have to be there for people with honesty and truth and with grace and with love. But I want to tell you today that it's worth the work, that the prize that's set before you is worth more than anything that you could attain in this world outside of having God in your life. That yes, it may be difficult sometimes to be a believer and to, to live how Christ has called you to live, but I'm telling you, I promise you today that it is worth the work. Our scripture takes us to a time in Israel where they had been finding themselves in a cycle of drifting away from the Lord. They were saved by God and given their own land and, and, and made conquerors and able to take over all of this vast land that God promised to them. But Judges chapter 1 says after they had settled in these lands that they did what was right in their own eyes. That instead of following the instructions that God had given them and, and, and he had shown himself faithful by giving them all of these blessings, instead of following him faithfully, they did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was easy. They did what they felt like they wanted to do. Instead of following God's instructions, they did what was right in their own eyes. And they refused to do what God had prescribed for them in the law. And it caused them to drift further and further away from a relationship with God. And as they drifted further a relationship with God, eventually God said, you know what? If you want to do your own thing, then I'll remove my covering from you and let you experience what it's like outside of relationship with me. So as God removed his covering from them, Foreigners would come in and invade the Israelites. At this particular point in the scripture, the Philistines were the enemies that they were dealing with. And for 40 long years, they were being oppressed by the Philistines. And yet, God heard their cry even as they had moved away from him. Even though they had done their own thing, when they repented and cried out to him, God heard their cry. And I want to let somebody know before we even get any further into this lesson today, that if you've taken time in your life and you've moved away from what you know is right and you haven't been living according to how you know God has called you to live, that you're never too far to cry out to him and have him hear you and act on your behalf. Never get so discouraged and believe that you've out God's grace. Never believe that you're not able to come back to God and follow after him and allow him to be in right relationship with you yet again. You're never too far. So in this oppression, they cry out to God and they're back in this cycle as God comes and he decides that he's going to send somebody to rescue them. That he sends somebody to come in to come and, and remove the enemy that had been oppressing them. And it's beautiful to see that God is noticing what's taking place and isn't ignoring what's happening to his people. And so God sees fit to send a hero to come in and rescue his people. And after 40 years, he finds a man by the name of Manoah and his family that will come in and produce this man that will come and save the Israelites. Now, what's interesting is, is he chooses this man, Manoah, whose wife is barren. She can't have children. Yet God comes in and he says, this is the family that I'm going to select to bring a, somebody who can rescue the people. And I'm going to bring a child to somebody who was barren. Now, in a day and age where the worth of a family and their lineage was based on 
the children that they had was based on their heirs when the worth of the family, because I know we live now in a society that, that, that is egalitarian almost and cares about everyone, but in this day and age, the value of the family was based on the heirs and the children that they could produce and the lineage that could keep going on, and God decides that he's going to use a family that can't produce a lineage. They can't produce somebody that can keep going on and on. He chooses a woman who is barren. And that lets us know already that we should never put a limit on who God can use. God can use people that we don't think have any value. God can use people who we've overlooked. God can use people who we look at maybe as small and don't think they have much of an impact because when God steps in, he can do great things with small packages because we know that God can make the impossible become possible. With man, it's impossible. With, with God, all things are possible. We see that God decides to use this family even though the world would probably have written him off. The angel of the Lord appears to this woman, the wife of Manoah, and he comes to her and he says this in verse 3, or in verse 1, says the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. And that brings me to my first point, which is this. The word of the Lord is paramount. The word of the Lord is supreme. The word of the Lord is greater than any reality that you may see in front of you. The word of the Lord is paramount. It's supreme and it's above anything else. And in fact, the Bible says that the word of the Lord will accomplish whatever it's set out to do. So if the word of the Lord says it, it's going to make sure that it happens. Creation has to abide by what the word of the Lord says. It's not bound by any law. It's not bound by any restriction. The word of the Lord will come to pass, and it is paramount in any circumstance. So because he has the final say, we don't consume ourselves worrying about the how. We just know that he's able to, and if we trust in him, that he can make this impossible circumstance turn into something that's very plausible and possible because his word is paramount. What's so beautiful about Manoah's wife's interaction with this angel is that the angel doesn't deny the reality of the situation. In fact, he reminds her, he says that even though you have been unable to have children, so he says you haven't been able to have kids. I'm acknowledging it. I'm not having this blind attitude and acting like that didn't happen. I know that you weren't able to have kids. But even though you weren't able to have quit kids, you will soon become pregnant. He states, and let it be known that even though you were unable to do it in the past, even though you were unable to accomplish it beforehand, that the word of God supersedes whatever happened in the past. That the word of God is stronger than anything you've experienced and been through before. The word of God is bigger than anything you may perceive that you see in the right now. That God's word is greater, and so I can acknowledge the truth of what's going on, but still know that God can handle it. I can acknowledge what I'm facing right now and still know that God is sovereign and greater than that. Because he's, he's the God in the impossible. Romans 4, 4 and 17 says, God calls into existence the things that do not exist. Meaning he, he says things and they have to obey. And even though it didn't exist before, even though we didn't see a cure or healing before, even though we didn't see a child or a baby before, even though we didn't see a, a, a brought together relationship before, that when God says it, it has to react and listen. He's sovereign and his word is paramount. He's not written restricted by the laws of the world. And you, you, you may not have, have, have had the resources you, you needed in the past. But, but when God says it's yours, when God says that this belongs to you, it doesn't matter what the past says. I believe what God says for me now. I believe that he is sovereign and that his word stands alone. You may not have been qualified. You may not have had the education that, that you thought you should have. You may not have the, the rank and positioning that, that you think you need. But when God says it, it doesn't matter about any of the other factors because his word is paramount. His word is what we rely on. His word is what the truth comes from. And even though the circumstances may not match it, he says he takes the things that don't exist and speaks them into existence. 
that God can take the things that don't seem likely and speak them into your life and take you to a level that you've never experienced before, that you never thought was possible. And matter of fact, he says you can do exceedingly, uh, abundantly, above all we could ask or imagine. He takes these things that seem impossible and does them because his word is paramount. His word is over all of those things. We, we don't have to ignore the reality. I'm not telling you to go around here and, and, and act like what's happening isn't happening. Because if we ignore the reality, that minimizes his miracle. If, if I'm walking around here and I'm, and I'm really dealing with an illness and I'm really dealing with something that's taking me down, I don't have to go around complaining about it all the time. But I don't have to deny I have it because I can acknowledge the fact that God can heal me. That God can bring me through it. So, so even though I, I don't have to deny that it's happening because his power is stronger than whatever I'm facing. I, I could be dealing with issues in my life and, and, and it's okay. I don't, I don't, I'm not telling you to go around here and complain about them. But I'm telling you that you can acknowledge them because you have faith in God to deliver you from them. That you believe that he's stronger than what you're dealing with. That his word is truly paramount. And so... The angel of the Lord didn't deny the fact that she, didn't have, she couldn't have kids before. In fact, he mentions it again. He stands on that word and lets it be known that God is going to do something great in this circumstance that was bad before, that, that was unsatisfactory before, what, what, what you didn't enjoy before. God is strong. And I, I have faith that God's word is true. And so I can have joy in the midst of my circumstances because I believe that his word has the last say so. I believe that his word is what will eventually show itself as greater than anything else. His word. That's why I'm not afraid to do the work. That's not why I'm not afraid to do what God has called me to do. Regardless of what the situation looks like, it's worth it to do the work because God's word and what he has planned for us will eventually be what displays itself. So I'll do the work. I'll be glad to do what God has called me to do. I'll be glad to follow his instructions. Why? Because he got the final say so. Why? Because he's going to be the one that ultimately prepares the place that I need to go. And he'll place me there if I'm just obedient and do the work. But that also requires that I abide by the second point that I have for you today. What's the second point that I have for you today is to follow the instructions you are given. Follow the instructions you are given. We, we play a part in the promise. We play a part in the promise. It's worth it to play your part in the promise. It's worth it to do what God has called you to do in regards to this promise that he's made to you. He gives instructions. The angel of the Lord gives very specific instructions to Manoah's wife on what she needs to do in order for the promise to come to pass. He tells very clearly what he wants her to do. When Manoah's wife comes to, to, to tell her husband what the angel of the Lord says, he, he says there are certain, she tells him there are certain things that the angel wants me to do in order for this promise to happen. And so uh, when, when, when Manoah's wife comes to him, he, he asks a couple questions. He, he has a couple desires. He first wants to meet this angel that she talked to. <laughs> He want to make sure his wife wasn't going crazy. He said, uh, you know, let, let me talk. God, God, um, can you send that angel back? Because she's saying some real crazy things right now. We've been together for a while. We ain't been ever to have no kids. And it ain't been going that way. So, can, God, can you send that angel back? Because I, I need to verify for myself that what she's saying ain't crazy. And so he needs verification. And he's, he's asking. But he doesn't just ask for God to bring the angel back just for the sake of it. But he says, I need the angel to come back so I can ask for further instruction. I need the angel to come back to confirm the instructions. This is good news. This is good news. God, if, if we're really about to be parents, I, I'm excited about it. But he says, let the angel come back so that I may inquire more questions from it, so that I may inquire instructions, so that I can learn exactly what I need to learn from it and follow through with that. And I'm curious today, how many times have you been excited about a promise that God has made to you? But instead of going to him and, and seeking instruction and seeking direction and seeking guidance, you run towards what you think he's going to give you and you run towards the blessing and you run towards whatever prize is there before you and you forget to inquire of God for instruction, for direction, for guidance and things that will actually let you prosper when you get to the blessing. You get so excited about the blessing that you forget about the one who's blessing. And so when Manoah finds out he's getting a blessing, he says, Call the angel of the Lord back so I can inquire more instruction. 
so that I can make sure I'm going the right way, so that I can make sure that I raise this child the right way. I'm getting a blessing. You're blessing me with an heir. Lord, I'm so excited about that, but let me do it the right way. Don't let me falter in what you bless me with. Don't let me fumble the blessing that you've given to me. Don't let me be irresponsible with what you've blessed me with, God. So I need your instruction. I need your guidance. Let, let, let the word come back to me because I'm a fail if I do this on my own. It's already hard being a parent and you want special things to take place with this child. I need your guidance. And so, yes, he gets excited and he, he wants to meet the angel, but he is asking for instructions. And we have to stay in lockstep with God instructions so we can correctly execute the mission that he's put us on so that we can move in the direction that he's called us to move in. Manoah's wife had to, to not only listen to the instructions of the angel because they were divine, but because this was a conditional promise. The fact that she was going to get a child was a conditional promise. It was contingent on some things. It was contingent on him saying that don't drink any alcohol. And he said, don't eat any unclean food. That is how the promise will come to pass. This is your faith that you're stepping out on, that you're abstaining from alcohol and you're abstaining from these unclean foods. It was conditional. There was a condition to the promise. She had some responsibility in this to see it come to fruition. And I want to tell you today, we shouldn't be so arrogant to believe that God would do something for us and we don't up, uphold our end of the bargain. That he would make a conditional promise to us, but we decide we're not going to do our part, yet we get mad and expect him to do it for us anyway. Uh, uh, let's be honest, we can't expect all things to be added unto us if we don't first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's a condition to that. Yes, all these things will be added unto us, but first, seek God and his righteousness. We, we, we can't expect the all things to work together for our good and we're not moving according to his purposes and don't love the Lord. There's a condition to these things. These are great promises that God has aligned for our lives. But there is a condition that we need to fulfill in our lives so that we can see God's blessing take place in the fullness of it. We can't expect these things to happen if we're faltering and we're not faithful to the condition that he made for us. We're all familiar with, we're all familiar with this, this concept of conditional promises. If we've ever worked before, if we ever have gone to work and we have gotten a job, and let's say we got the job and on the interview they say, congratulations, you got the job. We're going to pay you $350,000 a year in two-week increments. I'm speaking that prophetically over somebody today. You're going to get that call, you're going to get 350 <laughs> Myself, I'll take that too. But if they tell you this and they say, we're going to pay you in two-week increments, when you begin to work, you have to understand that you're not going to get paid that very day. But you know that the promise is that you're going to pay me every two weeks. You know that the promise is that I'm going to get compensated for what you say belongs to me. That you're going to give me what you say you were going to give me. And so you work and you can do it faithfully. Because you're familiar with conditional promises. You believe that if they tell you that, that after I work my 80 hours, that they're going to bring me a check with a lot of zeros on it that I can go to the bank and cash. Because that is the condition that I work and that I'll get what you promised to me. But how crazy would we look if we went to the office two weeks after we got hired, didn't work a single day, and walk in there and strut in there and say, where my check at? Like, Excuse me? You were supposed to start working here two weeks ago. We didn't found somebody else and fulfilled your position. You don't work here, sir. How crazy would we look if we expected something that was conditional, but we didn't fulfill our part of the condition? We would seem insane because there is work that is required in order for us to get to the promise that has been given to us. And it's the same way in the kingdom. We should understand that God has made us these beautiful promises. God says that we have access to great things. God has blessed us with blessings that only he can give, yet and still, we don't want to fulfill our end of the bargain. We don't want to seek him first. We don't want to be those people that are dedicating all of our time. We don't want to be those people that are true and honest to his word. And because of that, we miss out on the fullness of the blessing that he has. And God is calling us to live to a higher standard today. God is calling us to be people of integrity, calling us to abide by the condition so that we can experience the fullness of the promise. 
so we can live in what God has for us. Manoah's wife, she could have gone on drinking wine and drinking alcohol, pouring up Hennessy, drinking gray goose, eating her pork, loving some bacon and, and ham and eating all the unclean foods, doing what she wanted. She could have went and did that because, you know, she could have made excuses and saying, well, I just need my wine so I can wind down this evening. It's stressful living in these medieval times. I need a glass of wine so I can wind down. And, and I can't have breakfast without my bacon. You know, I, it's just not the same without a little pork. And, and, and she could have easily made excuses as to why she could not have fulfilled the condition of her life. But she would be forfeiting her blessing for a temporary pleasure. Forfeiting what God has for her forfeiting the, the, the major impact she would make on this entire world because of a temporary pleasure. And I have to remind you today, don't lose out on what God has for you in this great story that is your life for temporary pleasures that won't even last you very long, for temporary gains that will eventually be erased. We should be confident in who God is and be ready to abide by his word and follow his instruction, fulfill our part of the condition so that he can allow the promise to abide and abound in every area of our lives. His plan is always better than what we see in front of us. His plan is always greater than the small pleasure we can get by not abiding by it. And so let's make it our goal to fulfill our condition and do all we can do to, to get what God has set aside for us. And the final point I want to give you, it is worth it to do the work because your promise serves a greater purpose. Your promise is greater than what you see on the surface. Your promise is more than just you. It's more for just you and your family. Your promise is greater because it's ultimately to be used for God's glory. God will receive glory from what he establishes in this earth. Now, I know Manoah's wife had to deal with, with the pain of being barren in this society that was misogynistic and, and, and only saw value in the element of having more children. I know she had to deal with shame and embarrassment over the fact that, that, that she couldn't have children based on how that society operated. I know she dealt with these things. And, and Manoah didn't have the pride of, of having an offspring to continue his family, but God saw fit to bless them with an heir to carry on his family name. It changed their whole situation around. Their family would have ended with them, yet God saw fit to bless them, and it allowed their family name to keep going forward with an heir that could keep impacting the world. It was a blessing for that family. It was a blessing for them to be able to have the pleasure of raising their own child and, and, and being able to be in close fellowship with this child that they brought into the world. And I know I got three little humans. I, I understand the, the, the blessing it is to have them. And, 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 and I know mothers can relate having to carry around these kids for nine months and then birthing them into the world, not being able to do a single thing. They can't feed themselves. They, they can't even move themselves. They, they can't eat for themselves. They can't do anything but just be there, and you're their sole source. So I understand the blessing that comes with it. I understand what she felt when she got the opportunity to hear that God was going to give this to her. And it's a really beautiful thing, and it was already a huge blessing, but for Manoah, that wasn't the only reason that God was giving them this child. Manoah wasn't just going to get it so that they could have warm fuzzies because they got a child. Manoah just wasn't getting this child so that they could pat themselves on the chest and say, we have an heir now. We have a child who can take on our legacy. In fact, the second part of verse 5 says, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. He was positioned to rescue Israel from the oppression that they had been facing. Remember we talked about earlier how the children of Israel kept drifting away from God and God was sending somebody to come in and help them out? Not only was this blessing going to provide them with an heir, but it was going to provide the children of Israel with a, somebody to rescue them. 
And so it was twofold. It wasn't just singularly so Manoah could be happy in his family and have an, an heir, but it was also so the people of Israel, the entire country, the whole nation would be blessed through this blessing in their household. The entire nation would reap the benefit of God's goodness to this family. Everyone would be blessed by what happened to this particular family. And I want to tell you today that it's good to enjoy the blessings that we receive. It's in good to, to be in awe and wonder of what God has provided for us in our lives. But at the end of the day, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. At the end of the day, it's not just about what God is blessing you with for you to heap upon yourself. But you have to understand that there is a greater purpose for the things that God is putting in your life. That'll help you not to squander it. That'll help you not to be somebody who wastes the resources you get when you realize that God has a bigger plan and purpose for the things that he's given you. It's our job to, to steward over the blessings that he gives us so that we can accomplish the greater purpose of his glory in the world. So when, when God blesses you financially, when, when God has given you more than you need and, and has heaped these things upon you, it's not just for you to keep to yourself. The old saints would say you are blessed to be a blessing. That, that God has put this in your life because it's bigger than you. It blesses you. Yes, you're able to, to move forward and be uh, successful with what God has given you, but it's bigger than you. Praise God that you've gained this status and recognition, that you got all them followers on social media, that you got everybody hanging on to your next word and waiting for your next post. But he didn't just give you that status to heap it upon yourself. You were blessed to be a blessing. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than just you. It's awesome that, that you have the influence that you've garnered. It's great that, that people are listening to your word, but it's not about you making it about yourself so that everybody just follows you blindly, but it's for you to point others towards God so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's bigger than you. Somebody say it's bigger than me. I think about insects that, that pollinate flowers like bees. Bees are herbivores and what they do is they go plant to plant and they suck the nectar out of the plant and feed on the nectar of each plant and they feed themselves and as they go to these different plants what happens is they begin to spread the pollen that was in that plant to other plants so they're feeding on the nectar and they're getting full and as a byproduct they're also spreading pollen that helps the other plants to grow and, and plants are cross-pollinated because when that happens, it helps growth for the crop. And there are literally hundreds of foods that we eat as humans that require pollination from animals like bees and birds and different animals that pollinate, that, that spread pollen. And so while the bee is getting blessed and getting full, and eating all of the tasty nectar that is in this plant. He's also spreading pollen and helping the crops grow and giving us an opportunity to eat, giving humans, people that are thousands of times bigger than this insect that spread this pollen, an opportunity to eat and to be nourished and to be filled. Yes, it is blessed because it's full and it's got all the nourishment that it needs. But it's bigger than just that bee eating and getting a full stomach. It's helping your stomach get full because of what the bee does by pollinating other plants. It may not seem like a big thing on the surface, but it is major in your life that you take full advantage of what God has blessed you with and use it to benefit the kingdom as a whole. That you don't be selfish with it, that you're not stingy with it, that you realize you're gifting, that you realize you're blessing, that you realize the things that God has provided you is bigger than just you I know we like to look this is a, a country that is focused on self America loves us some us but at the very end of the day we have to be understanding of the fact that our blessing isn't just for me my four and no more but that instead that we are God's hands and feet and we realize that things are bigger than us and that others are affected by what we do and so the angel of the Lord, he instructed Manoah's wife to raise their son as a Nazarite, meaning that he couldn't have any, any fruit of the vine, he couldn't have any wine, he, he wasn't allowed to cut his hair, 
and he wasn't allowed to eat anything unclean for the entirety of his whole life. Now, um, raise your hand. I want to take a poll in here right now. If you've ever cut your hair, <laughs> if you've ever eaten anything that they would consider unclean, I'm talking about pork, any bacon, any ham, any, anything like that, any crawfish, you know, anything that was considered shrimp, anything that was considered unclean, or, or, or if you've ever um, done anything that, that, that requires alcohol, you know what I'm saying, if you've ever had a sip of, 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 of wine, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, um, if you've ever had any, anything that, that, that uh, isn't a soft drink, uh, if you've ever had any of that, uh, he was not allowed to do any of those things. He was not allowed to have any of those uh, experiences from birth. And we all know that Samson didn't live up to those expectations. We talked about Samson. We know that he went and did all three. He, he went and drank. He went and ate unclean things. He went and had his hair cut. And all of these things happened, and he didn't live up to them because he, he, he lived with contempt for them. He was born with having to fulfill this because what we didn't discuss is the fact that Nazarites, they usually were people that took a vow. They decided that they were going to be Nazarites. They decided that they were going to do these things, and they only did it for a certain amount of time. But the angel of the Lord says that he'll be a Nazarite from birth, meaning that he didn't have a time limit that he could uh, do this and then go drink and then go cut his hair and do all those things. That it was his lot from the entire entirety of his life. And I can imagine how doing these things were difficult. We just all saw that all of us have partaken in one, if not all, of those things that were listed. And yet he had to do it for his life. But he didn't realize the impact that he could have had had he maintained what God told him to do. Had he done the hard work and stayed focused on the mission that was at hand. Now listen, God allowed Samson to literally defeat thousands of Philistines. Thousands of the enemy were defeated through him and he didn't do what was right. He held it with contempt. He didn't follow the instructions, yet God was still faithful enough to a certain extent, to a certain point, to use him even though he was doing wrong. How much greater would Samson have been had he done the work and stayed faithful to what God called him to do so that he could fulfill the purpose that God had for his life? I'm trying to tell you today, yes, the work may be difficult at times. Yes, it may seem like, woe is me, and why do I have to be the one that does right? Why do I got to be the one not to tell them people off when they did me wrong? Why do I got to be the one to love them people even though they're my enemies? Why do I got to be the one to turn the other cheek? And it feels difficult sometimes when we have to do what God has called us to do, but when I'm telling you in the in the power that comes when we submit our will to God, the power that's available for us when we say, God, not my will, but yours be done. What we're able to do on this earth when we follow God's instruction is much greater than anything else that we would have if we decided to do it on our own. I'm asking you today, how would your life look if instead of doing it your own way, you just said, I'm going to do the work? It's worth the work. I know it looks difficult. I know it looks like everybody else is having fun and you're the only one that's not. But I'm telling you today, the sacrifice is worth the work. It's worth seeing God's will come to pass. It's worth seeing his glory throughout this earth. And I want to tell you a secret today that only what you do for God will last. Only the things you do for him are what will outstand the test of time. That yes, it may be difficult, but I'm encouraging each and every one of you to do the work. Doing the difficult thing opens the doorway for greater impact. Doing what's hard, doing what others may skip over and may not want to stick out is what leads to greatness. Imagine the lives that would be strengthened, the, the, the strongholds that would be broken. Imagine the demons that would tremble and be defeated. Imagine the sinners that would be converted. Imagine what would take place if you did the work. If you said, instead of taking the easy way out, instead of compromising, instead of ignoring the instructions, I'm going to do the work. How would your life look? How would your impact be? I'm here to let you know today that the eyes of God go to and fro, seeking who he can use. The things that he does on this earth, he does it through you and me. We're people set aside to do God's work. 
Will you be willing to do the work today and to fulfill your purpose so that God's plan can be put on display? I'm praying that it you would and that you would be confident to do God's work. I'm going to pray over you. Lord God, I thank you for these, your children. I thank you for blessing them and strengthening them. I thank you for reminding us today that even though the work can be hard and difficult at times, that the promise that you've made for us is worth doing the work, that the good things that you have set aside for us, that you had planned for us before the beginning of the earth, Lord God, that they're worth doing the work for and they're worth listening and following your instructions throughout it all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We thank God today for his word. We're grateful for the opportunity that we had to um, understand God is still doing great things through his people. And these conditional promises just require us to do the work. For those that are in this building today, or maybe you're watching this online and you're joining us live, uh, we never want to leave this place without offering you an opportunity to have a relationship with a God who loves you, with a God who sees your faults, sees beyond those things, and still loves you. And so if today you say, I want to be in relationship with that God, I want to have the confidence to know that my eternity is sealed, and I want to be someone who is confident in who God is. If that's you today, we're going to pray together. And as we pray together, I want you to know that the decision you're making will be life-changing and life-altering. I'm going to pray over you. And as I pray over you, um, this is your opportunity to receive God as your Lord and Savior. Lord God, I thank you for each person under the sound of my voice. I thank you for each heart that has been stirred by the words that were spoken. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness and your kindness. Lord, I pray today that you would open the hearts of those and fellowship with those that desire to, desire to have you as their Lord and Savior. Lord God, let them know that all they have to do is confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you rose Jesus from the grave. And Lord God, they will be saved, Lord God. Lord, strengthen them on their walk. Be with them as they go forth. Lord, let them get in good fellowship with other believers and help them be strong in the faith. Lord, let them know you love them and that you care about them, Lord, and that you have defeated death in the grave. And as they confess their sins to you, Lord God, they will be forgiven. Thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you today. Um, before we end this broadcast, I want to um, invite you out to come worship with us. We're here at 3710 Wellington Street right here in Greenville, Texas. We'd love to have your, your face in the place and have you come and worship with us as we um, praise the Lord and, and hear God's word. Um, also, if you've been blessed by this and you want to partner with us in giving, what you'll see come on the screen now is our cash app. You can uh, donate there at dollar sign rivers of love church um, we'd love to partner with you in the work that we're doing in this community um, coming up next month we're going to be giving out some scholarships to the children in greenville and we're excited about that and so if you want to partner with us we'd be glad to um, partner with you in that regard um, also go visit our website uh, www.riversoflove.net you can see what we're all about there and see all the latest updates of what's taking place here at rivers of love want to let you know that god loves you and so do we go out and have a blessed week